Hello, everybody, and welcome to the stream. Uh, this is, I guess, the second in a quickly developing series of sit-down chats that I get to have with game developers, which is really exciting. Uh, and today is an especially exciting one for me because uh, I managed to harass Kevin Crawford into joining us. Hi, Kevin. Hello. <laughs> Well, hello, Adam. Good to be here. I'm I'm so glad to have you. I so I I'll I'll begin. I'm gonna I'm gonna get you to tell us a little bit about who you are and and kind of what you've been up to. But uh, this is particularly special for me because my playing Stars Without Number and my being a tabletop role playing game Twitch streamer uh, align pretty much one to one. Uh, I got my start in this space. Uh, playing your game. So here we are at the at the beginning of a new campaign of Stars Without Number on Roleplay, and you have a new version of the game, and, and everything is coming full circle. So thank you so much for uh, for joining us. Um, for folks who uh, are in the minority who do not already know who uh, Kevin Crawford uh, is, tell us. Tell us a little bit about yourself, please. Please. <laughs> Well, for myself, I am the sole member and designer of Cine Nomine Publishing, uh, a company that got its start pretty much as a librarian in joke. Mm -hmm. yep. You see, for around oh, 15 years, it must have been, I worked on at uh, the Yale's Divinity School Library down in their special collections. And it turned out that the way you represent an item that doesn't have a known publisher is you write Cine Nomine in the entry. So, out of general spirit of malice towards future librarians, I decided to name my publishing company Cine Nomen. <laughs> that's that's actually really good. Like I knew I knew that the uh, like I knew what Cine Nomen meant, um, but I did not know that that was why it was called that. That's that's nice. That's a good mean spirited joke. I like it. Take that, librarians. <laughs> that's fantastic. So so you've been you've been publishing games for for how long? How how long has Cine Nomen been been making stuff? Well, this November it will be eight years now. That's fantastic. And so, what was your what was your first the the first publication for for Cine Nominee? Well, that actually was Stars Without Number. Yeah. Yes. That's exciting. I, so, so, so Stars, when you when you got started with uh, with Stars, when it was your your first game, what was I mean? Eight eight years in in human time is not that long, but eight years in tabletop role playing game publishing feels like a lot has changed. Um, what was it like back then in the yesteryears of eight years ago? Well, back then it was a matter of a great deal of luck in, in the main. When I started writing Stars Without Number, I had just seen uh, Albert Rakowski's Terminal Space game mm -hmm. come out, which is a sci-fi game based on OD&D. &D. I thought that looks like a lot of fun. It'd be a lot of fun to write my own role-playing game. And since I had a copy of uh, Adobe InDesign lying around and I wanted to practice my layout skills, I thought, why, well, I'll just write a role-playing game and use that as the grist for an InDesign file there. Mm -hmm. So I spent six months scribbling out there, and I thought, well, it needs something here, it needs something there. And when I got it done, I just stuck it up on the web somewhere, and I noticed a lot of people were enjoying it. And I thought, well, why not see what Drive Through RPG says? And I looked it up there, and they had quite straightforward and simple publishing guidelines. It's, it's not hard to get published with them. So I thought, I'll, well, I'll upload it here as a freebie. So I uploaded it there, and it blew up there. Yeah. Everybody interested in it. And I thought, well, hmm, why don't I, as it turned out just then, they were just then transitioning to offering POD with their PDFs. Mm -hmm. So at that very moment, I was able to create a POD of that, and while I was still giving the game away for free, I could then sell a POD. And that went over well enough that I thought, well, maybe I ought to write a supplement for this. So then I wrote Skyward Steel. And from there on, it's just been basically a matter of keeping things going and yeah, fleshing I, things out. Well, and I wanted to I wanted to call that out particularly because when you, you, you say so casually keeping things going, but anyone who has sort of paid attention to to um Cine Nomine as a as a company, you're remarkably prolific in terms of, of how quickly you produce content. You've made m more games in the eight years since you since you got started than I think a lot of designers make in their lifetime. Um 
what what is that what is that like what what fuels that that seemingly uh forest fire style uh publication schedule well mainly it's because i go at the at the soft side of game design now there is a hard side of game design one involving carefully integrated mechanics uh, very sophisticated conceptual ideas trying to attain for very, very delicate and precise results. People who are very obsessed with, with novelty, with new techniques, with exploring new possibilities. And that, well, very interesting and very useful for many people, is very hard. I mean, it, it is not something that people can do quickly as a general rule of thumb. This, this is very true in my experience. I agree. Yes. So you think I mean, that the it's, test- it's the it's the the product of the the structures around the games that you uh, that you're putting together, um, which, which is to say, I guess like the OSR at large, but the idea of building very directly on what came before uh, that allows you to to do that. I would say the the mechanical chassis underneath the soul is instrumental to that, mm-hmm. because when I approach a new game, I have my basic mechanical pattern already there. I mean, I do not need to research it. I do not need to to play test the basic bones of the system. The elaborations and the adjustments I make require some thought, but the, I don't need to wonder how I'm going to represent characters in this game. Mm-hmm. Right, right. And so it's more a question of bending the the structures gently rather than rebuilding from the from the ground up. Yes, adjusting for my particular purposes. Right, right. And so, so what do you, what do you feel like is the, what's the DNA that kind of runs through all of the, all of the games? Like what, what things do they have in common for, for you? For me, my touchstone is BX D and D. Good old fashioned mold they cook. Yeah. Yeah. And And what, what makes that a, a, a good tool set to build off of, do you think? Because in many cases, it's a lowest common denominator type of role playing game that is, fundamentally familiar to millions of people even people who do not like it understand it Mm, mm -hmm. i mean you give six characteristics from three to 18 you get hit points you put armor class you get d20 hit rolls you throw that out there people understand what you're talking about if i say somebody is a 10 hit dice fighter 90 percent of the gaming world is going to understand basically what i am saying even if they don't use those rules, or even if they translate them to a system they prefer more, I am communicating something useful with that. Right, right. That makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm like personally for me, uh, Molde is the the D that I always go back to when I want to play Dungeons and Dragons, and I and I think that, like you said, there's a there's a cultural touchstone element there. Um, not just thematically, but certainly mechanically. And so when you hand someone a, a character sheet that looks like a Moldvay character sheet in some way or another, uh, they're they're drawn to it. I think that's interesting because to me, Stars Without Number feels like combat and character are predominantly Moldvay derived. But let's, let's maybe talk a little bit about Traveler because I think Traveler is... J- just as uh, just as as entrenched in the the hobby, but not nearly as uh, as popular. Um, what how how much of Stars Without Number originally was inspired by or, or derived from from that system from Traveler? How much influence did Traveler have on on Stars Without Number? Well, as you can see, Traveler clearly had a very explicit influence on the skill system. Mm, mm-hmm. Now, I didn't want to take the conventional D twenty skill system where you roll one D twenty and add a number to it and hit a difficulty class that I didn't want to use that I wanted a bell curve right and if you want a bell curve and you want relatively small numbers then travelers d20 d 2d6 system is very appealing for that and also I thought well if I'm going to write a sci-fi game yeah why not make it as friendly as possible to pulling in all this traveler material that people have written right so why not so- use this so that was that was the that was part of the impetus, and that's that's interesting because the I think that the mechanical aspect, the the bell curve, and the sort of predictability of uh, of two d six and a modifier uh, versus the sort of swinginess of a d twenty, I think that's that's very clear from the design. But it's interesting that you mention uh, wanting to give people room to bring in familiar concepts and content from uh, from Traveler. 
Uh, that's not something that I would have I would have necessarily thought of. Do you find that that's that's something that happens a lot? Are there people who play stars with that number who come to it from uh, from being fans of Traveler? I don't know that so many people come to it from being fans of Traveler. Simply because Traveler has a relatively restricted market share. I'd say. It's huge. It's old. It's critical to the development of the hobby. But Traveler players are not a dime a dozen out mm. there anymore. Yeah, well, and I, I think I think that it's it's interesting because the the traveler lineage as a as a game, um, it it's complicated. There's a lot of branches on the on the traveler tree. Um, if I were to introduce someone to playing traveler, um, I, I I'm not sure I would know where to start. Um, and in fact, I think that I would I would likely instead suggest that they they play stars without number because it is so much more familiar. Um, where do you think yeah, where do you think stars of that number where do you think that it fits in the the sort of greater schema of sci-fi role-playing games um you know what what kind of what kind of person looking for a, a sci-fi rpg what kind of person does does stars of that number tend to attract do you find in my experience it tends to attract most of those people who do not have strong feelings about systems mm -hmm. people who in many ways just don't care about a lot of the things that that other people find very critical. I mean, with a lot, with my default player, these are people whose, whose strongest feelings are ascending or descending armor class. I mean, they, <laughs> right. Yeah, right. That, that's what they care most about. Sure. And they just want to sit down with their friends and they want to play a sci-fi game and they want to spend as little time as possible screwing around with the rules. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and now, I, I think that's that's a very that's a very OSR adjacent uh, vibe too for games because I, I feel like a lot of OSR games are like that too, where it's just like we just want to move past whatever the current mechanical thing is and on to the next thing. Yeah, it's with a lot of people, they just want to sit down with their friends and they want to play a game, and they do not want to spend two hours struggling with the rule book to figure out how exactly they're going to do that. Mm-hmm. Some of these people may search out ultra light or ultra simple games for that sort of thing. But the thing is, with even an ultra light game, you have to learn those rules again. You have to learn how an ultra light game does things. And there are certain voids in ultra light games that have to be supplied by the GM and the players. Mm -hmm. And when you put a game on a 8x5 sheet of paper, you're leaving out a lot of stuff by necessity. Right. And you were assuming that the GMs and the players can bring that to the game. So in many ways, an ultralight game isn't necessarily ultralight. It just makes very heavy demands of the playing group. Right. It, it, offloads, it offloads the effort from the design onto the, the players at the table, which, which requires a, a fair amount of effort. I think it's, it's, it's interesting because I, I think in, in your games, and, and you can tell me if I'm, if I'm off base here, but I feel like a lot of that offloaded effort gets put onto tables. Um, I feel like, in a way, because of the sandbox nature of the game, uh, there is this expectation of being able to say, wherever the players go, it's the responsibility of the, of the game master to find something for them to do where they go. But instead of simply saying, make it up yourself, you're a creative person, uh, something that drew me to Stars Without Number was the massive amount of tables that would say, you don't have to make it up yourself, roll a d20 or roll a d100, and, and here's your NPC, here's your, your friend or enemy uh, on this particular system, here's, here's your planet. Um, do you think that that is, that is something that, like, can you, can you talk a little bit about the idea of providing those, those sort of random tables and, and how tables fit into your games? Uh, as anybody who's read a CNA nominee product knows, I love my tables. We love them too. I just <laughs> love <them. laughs> mm -hmm. tables. Tables are extremely useful in a in a non obvious way. In an obvious way, they're giving you a list of ten or twelve or twenty items for a particular topic. You want to know about something, you look at the table, and you roll on it. Mm -hmm. But at a deeper level, what that table is doing is it is giving you a set of pattern cues. Humans like to make patterns. They like to make connections. But they need touchstones to make those connections. They need context to make those connections. Mm -hmm. So if I give you a list of 10 or 12 items of a particular sort, 
I'm priming you with the context and the touchstones to make your own connections. Because if I have, for example, intrigue in the court, here are 12 things that can be the case. Mm-hmm. Giving you those 12 things, you are seeing examples of what I am talking about in terms of intrigue in the court. Mm-hmm. And you are getting list and items and you're saying, oh, oh, this is what he means. So, and maybe I could take this and add it to that, or wait, I'm thinking of something myself. Right. And by and giving I've, you... I've, I've, absolutely, I've absolutely heard that, that concept discussed or talked about as uh, implied setting. That if you give people uh, a list of, of options, an exhaustive list of options, right? Say so there, here are 10 things that could be true. You're not just saying these are the only 10 things that could be true. You're saying these are the 10 kinds of things. And then people can derive from there. They can extrapolate a, a setting. And I think that contributes really heavily to, uh, to tone in a, in a game, um, which I think is yes, very it- cool. Yeah, it's it's very important that the the GM have specifics. Uh, one of the things I hate most in a role playing game is I'm reading along and I'm getting advice and I'm getting general advice. Oh, thank you. Yes, it's the worst. <laughs> I hate general advice. <laughs> general advice is worthless to me. I mean, if I was able to figure this out myself with just general advice, I wouldn't need the general advice. Right. I need help. Yeah, yeah. Specific, clear, do this, then do that. Here are some things that you can use. Yeah, I find there there's definitely a, a school of design uh, that tries to... It, it seems timid, right? That it's like, we, we don't really want to tell you how to GM this game because you're the GM and you're supposed to be the, the high authority. So we're just going to n- like nudge you and hope you get it right. We're going to say, maybe, maybe if you do it this way, if you felt like it, uh, to the point of sometimes offering multiple options in a situation mechanically, rather than just saying, this is how you're going to get the game that I would like you to play. Here, here is the, here is the rule for that. Um, yeah. I find it, it happens most often for the GM. Yes. The GM gets hit with this. And GMs do not thank you when you hand them that. I mean, they might feel smarter after reading it, but that isn't going to help them put together a a table's worth of entertainment for the night. Right. Right. Well, and I I feel like as a a game master, uh, reading Stars Without Number feels in a lot of ways written uh, for, for the GM. Um, the, the book does obviously provide rules for the players to create characters and uh, give them uh, opportunities to, uh, to, to sort of explore the world and mechanisms to do that. But I feel like the, the, the way that you write games, I, I feel, supports and, uh, and kind of engages the GM in a way that a lot of other games don't. There's a, a bit in Revised Stars of the Number that talks about how much prep to do that I, I absolutely took, took to heart. The idea that do as much prep as you think you need for the next session. And if it's still fun, keep doing it. And when it stops being fun, stop <laughs> doing it. And it seems like common sense, but I don't think I've ever read that kind of a, that, that, that statement in a game before, um, which I think is, is fascinating. Can you, can you talk a little bit about your, your thoughts between uh, the, the interaction between uh, the GM and the, and the designer and sort of the re- designer's responsibility for, for the GM's role uh, in games? Well, as a designer, I always write explicitly for the GM. Mm -hmm. The GM is the one I care about most when I write my games. Because if I do not have a GM, I do not have a game. Right. And if I can get the GMs, then I will get the players. Right. Now, it's important to actually give these tools to the GMs and to make make life as, as simple and easy and straightforward as possible for them because they have a lot of work on their shoulders. People tend to to overlook the amount of effort it takes to be a GM. I mean, there there's social efforts, there's design efforts, there's creativity required from it. You're basically coordinating things just to get a bunch of people around the table and pointed in the right direction. Right, let alone the and work that have, it requires to actually play the game. Yeah, and, mm-hmm. and they do not need their life being made any harder than it has to be. So when I... I think the the designer's obligation to the GM is to just to make life as simple as possible for them because the GM and the players are not as invested in the game as the designer is. I mean, they have choices. They do not have to play your game. Mm-hmm. They do not have to spend time reading your book. They have other things they can be doing with their time. Right. 
So if they have gone to the effort of downloading your PDF or buying your book or whatever, you owe them an easiest time as possible getting that onto their table. And also you have to respect the fact that most of your readers are not going to read your book. Right? I mean, they're going to skim it. Mm-hmm. They're going to read chunks of it. Uh, they just don't care all that much. And that's fine. That's sane. <laughs> I like I like that description of it. It's it's not it's not a requirement or an expectation that everyone will read every word of your book, and it's certainly not everyone at the table. And the idea that that's like a normal rational thing that you can design towards, uh, I think, is a good it's a good revelation to have as a designer, um, because I think that people can be designers particularly can be very precious about their work and this assumption that everyone will appreciate and understand every Oxford comma all the way through. Um, to me, it, it strikes me as a bit pretentious. Um, so it is, it's nice to, it's nice to hear that they're, they're that that's something intentional, um, that you think about that going in to the, to the design. So how do you, how do you draw people's attention to the parts of the book that matter? Uh, if you, um, if, if you, if you have this assumption that people won't read the whole thing. Well, the thing is you put the critical stuff for the players up front for mm-hmm. me at least, because I'm going to assume that a player is going to open that book they're going to read the one splash page, which sums up the whole game. You got one page to catch their attention, thinking, okay, maybe I want to keep reading this. And after you get that splash page, I go directly into character creation. Now, some people I know, they like to put world background up first, or they like to put general mechanics up first. Mm-hmm. In my experience, that doesn't catch the player. I mean, they, it might be nice if they understood these things and it might be nice to read the background of the world and all, but nothing catches a player's attention like giving them the idea of a character. Right. Giving them the image of somebody they could play in this game, somebody interesting, somebody fun. Once you've got that, if I've taught them how to make a player, the next thing I prefer to do is I put the, the systems right after that as close as I can. And I try to keep all of the game systems for the game as short as possible, preferably like a dozen pages tops, right there at the front of the book. Because if somebody has read the character chapter and they have read the systems chapter, that's all they ought to need to play the game. Right. Right. Yeah, and I, I think and, that I think that goes to support the 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 sort of toolkit uh, iteration of, of your of your games, right? For the players, there is there's a couple of chapters that they're going to need to know, and then the rest of the game, everything that comes after that, is uh, is tools for for the game master to uh, to to build that world and then to populate it and to make it work. Um, so that's it's interesting putting that that sort of stuff up front to grab the players. Is that because there's the assumption that the GM will be there with them through that and then read the other stuff on their own or is the do you expect the gm to skip over character creation when they uh, when they pick up the book the gm while a gm serves as a gm a gm also is a player they're mm. also participating in a whole game session mm-hmm. and when they see the kinds of characters that exist in this world that helps them understand the kind of adventures they're going to be having I mean, if I give you a list of, okay, an elf, a dwarf, a knight, and sorceress, that's going to be a whole different game you're looking at than an alien, two spacers, and a hacker. Right. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, and again, it goes, it goes back to that idea of implied setting, right? By bounding the player's choices, you're telling them what kind of world they can expect uh and and in a way too there's there's a level of information there for the gm to say the players can be uh the, one of these four things so be prepared to think about those four things as you uh, as you move into being the gm and to filling that space right it's your job to challenge and, and engage those four things that makes sense yes yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it does pattern things for the gm gives them a, a basis to start their adventure creation on or build their world on or we're understanding what kind of players are going to be looking at in this game. Yeah. So the idea is to engage everyone in the character creation process, but potentially for different reasons. That's interesting. Yeah, they're, they're all going to, have to be looking at one way or another, but they have different interests in what they're looking at. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
So when you when you build your your uh, you build a project when you write a write a book, um, you know when you impart that information, there there is to a degree some some amount of setting in in varying degrees. Some of your games have more setting and and some have uh, some have less. And I've noticed that the um, and I think this is like clear and obvious to anyone who who read it between uh, the original edition of Stars of the Number and the revised, uh, you removed the uh, the sample uh, sector. Um, and it feels like the um, the sort of general pre-game stuff, the history of humanity, has been buffed up a little bit. What can you talk a little bit about those those less implied those those direct setting materials uh, in a game? How much do you feel like your game needs a setting uh, to be able to impart what you uh, what you want uh, from the from the table? Well, and the specific reason for pulling the Hydra sector was was purely an issue of space. Yeah, because the the POD. The book was already about a hundred pages bigger than the original edition, and I was I was running out of space for stuff, so I deprioritized anything that people could still get free in another version. And since you could still download the original version of Stars Without Number to get the Hydra Sector, that went on the chopping block. Mm-hmm. The sense of of how much of a setting do you need to have in your game for people to play it? It actually you need very little setting, in my experience. Yeah. It depends on what tools you give the GM, however. There's a difference between a setting that you just don't give and a setting where you give tools for it. A one-page adventure game has very little setting attached to it. I mean, you might say, okay, this game is set in 1765 France, and you have just established a, a huge and vast setting for your game, but you haven't given the GM much to work with right there. Right. It's an invitation to go to Wikipedia and figure out what that means. Yeah. And on the other hand, you can have a, something like D&D, which had in the Moldvay basic uh, incarnation no setting whatsoever, mm-hmm. ex- just nothing explicit. And in Cook Expert, it barely gave anything more than that, uh, roughly two pages. But it had a great deal of implied setting in the random encounter tables, in the spells, in the uh, the basic way it structured the world. Now, if you're writing a game like that, for me, I care a lot more about getting system-neutral tools out there than getting a specific setting out there. Because settings are not nearly as popular as tools. I mean... Maybe I've got the magic hands that are going to write this compelling setting that's going to set everybody on fire, and they want novels out of this. They want right. Maybe that's going to happen, but that's not how you bet. I mean, that's I saw, not uh, how. Yeah, uh, as a, I saw, a, I saw a tweet the other day um, uh, by I, I think I, I think I can correctly attribute it to to James S. A. Corey, um, the author or authors, the Gestalt author of the Expand series, that basically said. Uh, I guess the way to write a successful series of novels is to make a deeply detailed RPG universe and then find someone to sell it to, uh, which <laughs> hurt me d- deeply as as a as a designer and as a, a player of games because I feel like there is very much this kind of harmful idea that we're all as game masters uh, frustrated novelists and you can you can feel that in a lot of games where. You'll get that character creation chapter. You'll get the five or six pages about mechanisms, and then you'll get 280 pages of deep, intensive yeah. setting material, um, totally disconnected from mechanisms of the game. And I, I don't think that I'm the audience for that, which is a, a part of why I'm I'm more drawn to a game like Stars Without Number. But it's certainly a thing. It's a it's a thing in in RPG design. It's still happening. You know, we we have these sort of Rune Quest style almanac core rule books um do you think do you think that 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 that's something why do you think people continue to do that like why is that still something in in role-playing games well because setting seems to be so important to so many games i mean there there are so many games out there that are attached to very deep intense carefully developed intellectual properties i mean Games Workshop. Right. That's their work. I mean, you dive into those Wikipedias, you're never going to be seen again. Mm -hmm. And Forgotten Realms. There's a whole generation of gamers who are raised on Forgotten Realms novels. Right. 
And over the years, it's sort of like like gaming has been its gaming has become its own fantasy genre. These novels and these creations have become the pattern for a lot of gamers. And I think a lot of gamers end up writing their RPGs and, and writing these intense, heavily created backstories because like they feel like they have to, like they're supposed to. Right. It's the way things like, are done. Yeah. And it's not even that they want to be novelists. It's not even that they want to write eight pages on the Dwarf Kings of 4,000 years ago that nobody remembers anymore. Sure. It's, it's, they feel like they've got a, a half a game if they don't do that. Right. I, I think that's, I think that's true. I think that's, I think that's, that's accurate. There's this, this feeling that like people will not buy your game or they won't read your game if you don't world build for them to some degree, um, which I, I would like to posit is false. I, I don't think, I mean, I think you and I have both had some success selling games that don't have these long drawn out sort of backgrounds. I think implied setting is much more powerful. Um, but do you, do you think that, do you think that that's something that will, that will change? Do you think that there's a way for, for us to escape that 300 page sort of setting material game? Honestly, I don't know. Mm. I mean, the momentum in the, in the industry, such as it is, in, it has a strength to it, but this latest edition of Dungeons and Dragons, for example, I mean, it does have a setting, it is attached to IP, and there is a weight behind that that's pushing it. But you also see smaller games that do not have that kind of weight behind them. Mm. And many games simply couldn't muster that weight even if they wanted to, because they've got one person writing for them, and he or she is not going to be sitting down and spewing out 300 pages of novel-type material mm -hmm. for every product they create. There's just no way they can create the same volume of IP as a team can, let alone a team on an intellectual property that has 40 years of history behind it. Right. So in some senses, I think it may be necessary for people to move away from that model simply because it cannot be sustained on the kind of industrial scale that we see from the bigger IPs in the industry. It just can't be done. Right. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's true. Yeah, it's a it's a bit of a fascinating time to think about uh, these. I don't even want to say narrative focused games, but games with their own highly developed worlds, because of course we're we're looking forward very quickly to the re release of or the new edition of, uh, of Vampire, which I think is probably the most egregious of those sort of the setting in which the game takes place is the most important thing rule sets. And I don't imagine that this new edition is going to move away from that. And I think people are, are drawn to it in the sense that you can buy a book and you can read it and gain some kind of, um, some kind of entertainment from that, even if you never play the game. Um, I, I wonder about that market. Uh, uh, people who buy rule books with the hope that they will play, but who never actually do. Um, and whether the, that's a demographic that can, people can choose to sell to. Well, I think it, it is a demographic you can choose to sell to online. Mm. The online gaming community is not the same as the broader non-online active community. Mm -hmm. the, their behavior is not the same. If you get Joe down the street who played D&D &D for 10 years when he was 18, I mean, sure, he may be fine for firing up a game, but he's not going to go online. He's not going to join forums. He's not going to be watching live plays. Mm -hmm. He's just going to play. Yeah. And if he likes a game, then maybe he'll buy it because he's using it, because he's playing it. Whereas if you're a part of the gaming community online and you're talking about all these games and you're hearing about all these games and you might buy them, even if you know you're never going to play them, just because you want to see them, because mm -hmm. you are a gamer, you are a part of this community and you buy the stuff that is associated with this community. But for every one of those online guys they're just the tip of the iceberg on the actual gaming community. I mean, the actual people who are playing games out there, the number of people who go onto the forums, who go on Twitter, who talk about this on G plus or whatever, uh, that's a very small fraction of the people who are actually out there playing this stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's an interesting thing to, to look at because there's a lot of buzz right now, especially from wizards of the coast about how, 
tabletop role playing games are sort of being uh, boosted, or or I've seen people describe RPGs as being saved, and I'm making big sarcastic quotation marks uh, <laughs> by this idea that suddenly everyone's watching Critical Role and they're they're picking up D and D for the first time, and that this is sort of the new the the new D and D player. Um, but there is, I think, I think you're, you're absolutely right. I think that there is this, this massive sort of hidden group of, uh, of people who don't engage with it as a meta experience. They simply just play the game with their friends and it's not a part of their larger, uh, their larger sort of media experience. Um, and so it's sort of, it's sort of interesting to me to see these two, these two pathways, uh, these two pathways develop, um, and kind of what, uh, what those divisions look like because i think that that you know you do you do have a, a good point in that you know not everybody's on g plus talking about role-playing games even people who are <laughs> desperately excited about role-playing games they're probably just talking to their friends that they're playing with um and that's something that i think has been true about about tabletop rpgs uh, forever and I, I honestly think that it's something that creates new um new game developers, right? Like uh, there's a point where if you're playing the right game, if you're playing a game that encourages it, uh, you're going to become a game developer because you're making your own stuff, right? You're creating your own things just for your table. Um, do you think, do you think that that's something like where, where is, where is the, the current and sort of next generation of game developers? Where are they coming from? People who are releasing games, what's in 10 or 15 years, what's the next, uh, you know, Sage Kobold or, or uh, Cine Nomine going to look like where, where did those people learn games from? Do you think? So that's a good question because right now the, hey, I would agree with Wizards of the Coast that we are getting a big influx of new people who are learning on D&D 5th edition. And I think it's inevitable that there's going to be a reaction to that in some time about people doing more with 5e or doing something different from 5e or responding to 5e in some way. Mm -hmm. and I think that these people, they are going to be seeing the, the existing independent game designer culture. They're going to be seeing existing games and how they do it. And they're going to be influenced by that as well. But I think just based on sheer numbers, it's it's like the reason why there are 500 D&D retro clones for every single uh, Marvel role-playing game retro clone or every right. single... Sure. Yeah. It's because there are 500 D&D players for every single Marvel role-playing game player. I mean, it's simply a matter of numbers. Well, yeah, and it goes back to what you said before about building games and, and what inspired Source of the Number in the first place was building games on a familiar framework so you don't have to teach people. Like, Dungeons & Dragons, in whatever form we imagine it to be, is the lingua franca of, of tabletop RPGs. Uh, this is why when people think of role-playing games, they assume we're talking about D&D about because that's, that's just the thing. And like you say, if you're making a game and you don't want to have to teach everyone how to speak the language again you can build it on that on that framework and be uh, assured if not an audience at least a group of people who are going to understand what you're trying to say so you see that continuing uh, I, and, and 5e sort of taking that that place i think that there's always going to be every every new generation there's always going to be a batch of heartbreakers out there I right and i mean the classic definition of you know the same game but with a tweak that's really important to somebody yes I think we're always going to get that batch, and it's always going to be a response to the most prevalent market leader out there, simply out of sheer numbers, because the most people are going to be playing that, and the most people are going to be responding to that. But in the same way that people are going to be responding to that, some of them are going to make responses that are a whole lot different than others. I mean, the categorical rejection of, of entire swaths of the rules are... Uh, new ideas put in there or, or seeking new mechanics entirely because they are different because they do something different than the market leader does. Mm -hmm. I think there will be, will be differences, but I think five E is going to be what people respond to. Yeah. I, I think we, and we can see this even though tabletop RPGs are still a fairly young, uh, industry hobby art form, whatever you want to call it. They haven't been around for that long as far as all these things go. But I, I definitely think that we can see, you can track this sort of um, lineage, this this sort of the, the king is dead 
the prince is going to respond aggressively to be very different from the king and then he becomes the king and dies and then the next one goes back to the way the first king was as a response to the second so we have these kind of like story is all that matters okay no let's get back to the the old school and let's look at mechanisms are all that matters and then a rejection of that and story is all that matters and these these kind of repeating patterns uh, as we go so yeah i think i mean i think that's a that's a good assessment that we're going to see this embracing of 5e that's happening now and you're likely to see uh, uh, an aggressive kind of counter response to that as well and i think in a way we're sort of seeing that too because like what was the to me at least the the big response to dnd's success was uh, white wolf saying like no no no, we don't care about yeah. wizards and knights we're gonna have you know angst filled gothic punk stories about being a vampire uh and so we're sort of seeing that uh, again too so you think that that's and, that's just gonna that's gonna continue that we're gonna get sort of the emulation of five e and then the the rejection of its style? I think that people are going to be trying to do that, but what they're going to res <laughs> sure. they're going to produce, I mean, it's it's like White Wolf to begin with. I mean, I played first edition Vampire right when it came out, and my introduction to it. My friend, well, I was sitting down to this gaming with my friends, and the GM said he had a new game he was going to play. And he walked us through character creation. And we, okay, we make modern day characters here. And then we go on this adventure and we get caught in a warehouse, and that's when we find out we're playing vampire. <laughs> right. And even though it was a modern game, even though it was set in a modern age and we were making these characters, we still had the instincts that had been inculcated in us by D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. And so as much as Vampire might have been wanting to be about a particular type of story, what you got was the classic trench coats and cantatas. Mm -hmm. And that's because your player base had been raised on certain assumptions and they enjoyed certain things. And so that was what they were going to play regardless of what mechanics you handed in there. I, I see this a lot in game design. I see game designers who have a very particular and specific idea about how they want their game to be played. They see that they want to do something new. They want to do something interesting. They're going to give you these mechanics and these tools for doing exactly this one thing. And then the players get in there and they pick things up by the wrong end and they hit something with it. <laughs> right. Sure. And they have a great time. They love it. They're using the game the completely wrong way as far as the, the designer is concerned, but hey, they're they just having a great old time out there. And this frustrates some designers. This upsets some designers. They're trying to bring a new experience here, and these troglodytes at the table just refuse to engage in the right way with their rules. So they make more rules. They make new rules. They make more specific mechanics to help force these people to realize what they're trying to do. And if they keep that up long enough, they, they ruin the fun for everyone. Mm -hmm. So do you think, do you think there is, is there a way to teach people to move away from that, that heavy gravity of, of D and D? Like, is there, is there a way to write a game that will, I guess, let you play vampires in a, in a, a warehouse without falling back on, on Dungeons and Dragons? Can we, or, or even should we try to, to reteach people how to create different sorts of fiction? I think you can invite people to do that, but any attempt to channel people to do that, any attempt to really push people to do that is doomed. Mm -hmm. And I think it's doomed because many game designers have a vastly overinflated estimation of their importance at the table. Right. They, they think they are a lot more important to what's going on there than they really are. <laughs> well, I think, I think part of what, what causes that is and 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 this is to to you know to sort of talk about some advice that you gave uh, to uh, to designers. I think that by the time you produce a game, you have suffered so much, either <laughs> for real or you've perceived your own suffering so much that you want to be important. It's very very hard when you release a game not to be like, now I have I have made my my have made my work. I have put this out in the world please love me, please love it, please do what I want you to do. And, and I think that there's this, there's this sort of, this sort of expectation that you are important because you suffered, which it sounds like you don't yeah. think is the case necessarily that your suffering does not imply you're important at the table. 
Well, it's easy for me to say because I pay, I get paid. I mean, <laughs> right. Most of these indie designers out there, they put this sweat and blood and torment into their games. They they suffer bitterly for it, and at the end, they know the only reward they are ever going to get for this game is internet backpats. Yeah, if that, if that, that is- it may only be someone notices your game and and <laughs> takes you, and takes you to task for ever having dared create it. I think that the the internet has the internet has bent and and changed the the way that it used to be, where you would spend. 10 years working on your your fantasy heartbreaker and then you would spend tens of thousands of dollars printing thousands of copies and dragging them to Gen Con and buying the expensive booth and selling five copies and dying with 9,000 copies of your game in your garage. Um, but it's, we've, we've moved away from that, but it still hasn't made, like it's not a, a thing that you can be successful at in any like meaningful way without a lot of work and a fair amount of luck. So how do we, I guess, how do we, how do we teach game design? This is the thing. How do we teach game designers that they're not as important as they'd like to be without also discouraging them from ever designing anything? Well, I think part of that is making it easier to actually make a game. Mm-hmm. If you don't have to bleed 10 years into a bucket to get this thing out on there, it might not be so terribly traumatic when people play it the entirely wrong way or never play it at all. Right. Now, a lot of what I've done, and CNA nominee has been trying to make things easier, not just for the GMs, but for also for the designers. One of my basic policies is when I do a Kickstarter or whatever, there's always a stretch goal which puts the art for that game as royalty-free c- for commercial use. I mean, all the art in Stars Without Number, for example, that isn't stock art I got from somewhere else, is available on Drive Through RPG, and any designer can grab that, can put that in their games, and can sell it commercially. I mean, I've seen stuff from my Godbound. I've seen it crop up on Steam and games mm-hmm. for computers. And that's good. That is what I want to see. I want to see small publishers go about their games not only easier, but also in a way that is is more financially defensible. Right. I mean, you, you can make money on role-playing games. It is possible. It is not easy, it is not simple, it is not assured, but it is possible. And you can do it if you follow certain basic principles. I mean, if you keep your overhead down, if you target a viable market, if you write something that people can use, if you market it correctly with a a freebie teaser to draw in people and then something to sell on the back end, uh, you can make enough so it might not sting quite so much that people don't really seem to respond to it the way you wanted them to. And I can assure you that money is a marvelous balm for the broken heart. <laughs> it's true. It's 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 one of those things where it's it's hard to separate the I I am doing this because I love the hobby and because I want to make the thing from that sort of Scrooge McDuckian voice in the back of your head saying like, yeah, but how much did you make from this versus how many hours did you sink in? Because you could have you could have been working at Burger King and made a lot more money in a lot less time. (laughs) Game design is one of those things where I think measuring monetary success versus measuring cultural impact is it's, it's tricky. It's very tricky. I think. I think a lot of game designers just resign themselves to the fact that they're never going to make a dollar on anything they do. Right. They just assume that this is going to be a shout in the void and, they're never going to get anything out of it. And that that is true in some cases. I mean, in some cases, you've got these beautiful, weird flowers out there that are wonderfully strange, that are never going to find a market in 500 years, but they are beautiful to look at. And you have game designers themselves who are so intense on a particular single product, a single idea, that they're never going to put together a game line anywhere. And that's perfectly valid. That is an okay way of doing things. If you only have one idea you care about, then one idea it is. Mm. But there's there's such a possibility out there, such such an enormous potential for creators to actually make meaningful amounts of money that it, it seems to me a shame that more people who could theoretically go after that don't. That they don't p- prepare themselves, they don't approach the work with the right attitude for getting a reward for all this effort they have put into it beyond 
internet appraisal or or whatever words they might get from friends right right and that i mean that that's a thing that i think is true about like art generally right you can you can make a beautiful painting and you can take a beautiful photograph and you can appreciate it for the beauty you have created in the world but it's nice if you could sell it too and and feel like you get some some uh some refund on that time and energy that you put in and people have different reasons for for designing things um but yeah, like you said, I think it's it's nice to be able to say, yeah, like this is a reasonably successful product because people care enough at least to uh, to download or to to buy it. Um, your your games and, and you talked about this a little bit earlier on. Um, most, if not all, of your games have a a free version, um, and not just and not just a teaser rules light, just a couple of like bits and pieces of the game, but by the full thing, but like the whole game essentially, um, which sets your, your purchasable products up as kind of prem, uh, premier versions or, or special versions of the, of the game with extra rules. Um, how, how, how has that been, been working for you? And, and sort of what's the, what's the idea behind giving away most of your work for free? Um, well, I think that's pretty much instrumental to my success, honestly. Because when you're dealing with indie role-playing games, your enemy is not is not the rest of the field. Your enemy is anonymity. Right. There are so many other choices out there that getting into your work has to be such an easy, simple, effortless thing that anybody who says, oh, I'm curious about that, I'll just go download it. You need to be as open as possible to the audience. It needs to be as simple as possible to get people to play your game. If a GM likes your stuff and a GM has bought your supplements and GM says to his players, okay, I want you guys to play this game. Let's play it. Just download this and we can play. There's no cash required, no monetary investment. All you have to do is download this and read the first 24 pages. Mm. And by getting that, getting those GMs and getting those players and trying to get as many people as possible playing this game, that gives you a much better chance of hitting on the whales who actually want to buy all this extra stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because if only one person in 20 out there actually cares enough to buy your stuff, you want a whole lot more than 20 people playing your game. That's right. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a very good insight. The idea that giving the game away for free broadens the net so that you can find those people who are going to engage more fiscally aggressively with your with your game and there's also the way that drive through rpg works its mailing lists as well mm. every time somebody downloads a freebie they go on your mailing list so that's why i've got eighty thousand people on my mailing list sure is because that's grabbed everybody who's ever grabbed a download a freebie cine nominee and has permitted me to send them emails mm -hmm. so when i have something new for sale I have a whole lot more people who hear about it than if I only ever restricted my, to myself to four pay materials. And as a side note, the pay what you want stuff, I would strongly recommend new game designers stay away from pay what you want. Mm -hmm. it, is, it has not worked out well for a lot of people I've heard from. Right. I, I think part of part of that, the, the idea, so for, for folks who might not be familiar with it, some RPG products are, are produced as a sort of pay what you want and you can depending on the tool, you can kind of set a window, say between five and $10 or between nothing and an infinite amount of money. Uh, and, and you can go ahead and, and buy the game. And for the most part, when given the choice, people will not pay you for, for the thing. So why not give it away for free anyway? And I, I've found that what that tends to do is say that you don't know how much your work is worth. It implies that you, you're like, well, I don't, I don't know how much this game should cost. So you can, you can tell me, um, and it, it creates a sort of mushy space around, around value. Um, and I, I would, I would agree with, with Kevin here that having two products, having the free version and then the, like, this is $10 because it's worth $10 bonus version or, or like core version of the game, uh, I think is definitely a better strategy for sure. And we've had, we've had the, sort of similar success. The, uh, that open door there is, is critical. And it's also important that there be something behind that door. You have to have a line of saleable products behind your freebie or else you're wasting your time. 
And I see far too many indie designers out there. They work hard, they sweat, they toil, they get their product out there, and then nothing. People who like that game, who loved what they did, have no way to give them any money. Right. And that that is a wasted opportunity there. Mm-hmm. If they love your stuff, if they want to help you, if they want to support you, give them a chance to do that. And that means new products, that means PODs, that means useful stuff that, that adds on to what you've already done for that open door. And because of the DTRPG POD model, print-on-demand, you never run into out-of-print issues. Right. Your backlog is eternal. Yeah, well, and, Every... and POD, POD is so much better now than it was uh, even even five years ago. Like, if you look at the quality, I can, I can look at books on my shelf from from Lulu, from Drive Through, and look at the the POD quality, and it's it's night and day in some cases. Um, so it's it's much it's much more enticing now, certainly than uh, than it was even a few a few years ago. Um, yeah, so a... so being 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 aware that I don't want to, I, I could keep you forever and. and chat about these things. I want to, I want to take a moment to ask you about something, uh, purely for my gratification. Can we, can we talk about in stars of the number? Can we talk about the faction turn the, the GM tool there? Because I think that if I, if I can go on a limb, I think that the, the faction turn in stars of the number is probably the most elegant, enjoyable thing that I have ever seen of your designs. I love it to death. It's why I started playing stars without number. Um, where, where, where did that come from? Because for me looking at it, I was like, oh, this is diplomacy. This is one player diplomacy. Where, what was, what was your inspiration for, for the whole faction turn? What, what problem design problem does it solve? I would love to hear kind of what, what inspired you to put that together. Well, when I was writing stars, the number first edition, I was saying, okay, the niche this is going to be shooting for is a sandbox game. Mm -hmm. So I've got all these tools here for building worlds. I've got all this stuff here for, for making people and organizations and whatever. But how is the GM actually going to make this stuff move? The players can't be the sole movers in this the sandbox or else it's going to feel like the spotlight is eternally following them around and nothing is happening outside their view. So what tools do I give the GM to let him or her move this stuff when the players aren't around? So, okay, we need factions. So what are factions going to do? Factions are going to be relatively abstract because I don't want to get down into the weeds of count and grab tanks out there. <laughs> right. You're not you're not designing like a, a GMT war game with little cardboard shits. Yeah, I mean yeah. no GM's got time for that. <laughs> right. So it has to be relatively straightforward. It has to be steady state in the sense that if nothing happens to a faction, very few numbers have to change from turn to turn. Mm. Try and make as, as little active attention as is necessary on that faction between turns if nothing is happening to it. Because the, the GM's attention between games is very limited. They've got only so much time, and you can't make them do a whole lot of Excel bookkeeping before they're going to get unhappy. So it has to be relatively minimal bookkeeping. And it has to give results that are probable and logical, but not always predictable. When grav tanks go up against native auxiliaries, you have to expect the grav tanks to win, but they shouldn't always win. Right, absolutely. There, there's there's a moment in in doing the the GM turn stuff for, for Swan Song where by by quirk of fate uh some some relatively strong landed infantry took out uh some spaceships there was a there was a pitched uh land land to air battle uh that did not go the way that we expected and and that stuff for me those little moments that the the fiction surprises you because the dice take it in a different direction uh that's some of my favorite stuff in the in the faction turn i i really enjoy when those moments uh, those moments happen the GM has to be surprised. Right. Surprising the GM is is a critical resource in any sandbox game. Because a GM who knows exactly what is going to happen, who knows or decides precisely how things are going to go along, has very little room for surprise and very little room for freshness outside of the player actions. If the only source of surprise is in player actions, and then you make 
a faction system that is very predictable and systematic, you're going to have a bored GM. Mm -hmm. They're just going to feel like they're moving counters around a board and they know how this is going to work out and they just need to finish doing the math problem to figure out exactly what the details are. That's, that's not an experience you want them to have. You want them to go into the faction turn and say, okay, I think this is probably what's going to happen, but let's see what exactly turns out. Yeah, in, in my experience on an emotional level as a, as a person engaging with the game in the GM's role, surprise and, uh, and th that challenge of the unexpected, whether it comes from the faction turn or rolling something unexpected on a, on a table, um, always inspires me to do more with what I have because now my brain is going faster trying to fit that in. So like, how, how did that infantry unit defeat the strike fleet? That's, that's a big deal. Now I have to fictionally justify that. Or, you know, why, why is this merchant uh, loyal to a faction that no one would expect. Why did these things happen? And and that's sort of the oracular nature of uh, of tables and and to a, a, a sort of more granular degree, the faction turn, I think, in that it provides the GM with surprise. Now now make this make sense. Um, which and I, I that surprise that. is you know, it's a resource of sandbox gaming. You want to nurture that and and encourage that and and make it make it a tolerable surprise, a surprise they can work with. I mean, an adjustment of the situation rather than sticking something completely out of context in there and say, okay, now make this fit. Right, because, you know, we, we do certainly have that historically in D&D, in &D, right? This is the four halfling traders on the sixth level of the Caves of Chaos. How did they get here? Why are they in a room that was previously full of hobgoblins? I don't know. I'm not going to help you with that as a game designer. You figure it out, I guess. <laughs> Um, which can be fun, but there there is that line of absurdity uh, that that can that can pop up. Yeah, it gets too crazy. You stop thinking logically about it, and you have fewer tools to deal with it. Right, right. Well, uh, I I I love the faction turn. We're doing some very some very weird things with it. We have our first uh, our first Far Verona uh, faction turn coming up on on Monday, and it's been it's been very exciting watching three thousand people play this game this faction game with me. Um, uh, well, I've mostly averted my eyes from that because mm -hmm. I know what an enormous strain this is putting on the basic system there. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, and I appreciate, so for, so for folks who may not be aware, um, there, there have been a few times where I've, I've gone onto the, gone into the, the vaulted halls of G plus and be like, Kevin, Kevin help. <laughs> so, I have 3000 people picking apart these rules and I need assistance in making a call about lawyers. Um, yeah. And, you know, and that's, that's certainly been a thing because I know, I know personally that this is where we are straining the system beyond its, uh, its intended purpose where we're the warranty sticker has been peeled way off. Um, but it's been, it's been fun. It's been fun sort of like looking at that and having, having all these people kind of say, well, what if this happened or, or how would, how would this go? Um, yeah, it's been well, fascinating certainly for me. Been impressed by how well you've been able to handle this here. I mean, this is, you're taking this way off brand, but you are you are holding it together as far as I can see. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. Uh, I'm taking again. I'm I'm doing what I'm doing what you did when you started Stars Without Number. I'm taking instruction from from Moldve, right? I'm I'm looking back and I'm saying, okay, well, how do I manage an enormous group of players? Well, I assign I assign callers, right? So I have I'm really only dealing with you know twelve or thirteen individual players who are reporting the, uh, the, the moves that they want to make with their faction as they've defined them from their, from their various democracies, right? So thankfully, I'm not GMing 3,000 people. I'm really just kind of, I have my council of, of reps who are passing me their, their orders and um, trying to use all of the, the tools that I've learned from sort of referee-focused GMing to say, okay, I'm going to make the, what feels like the fairest choice uh, according to the the stuff that the game has has given me, and um, it's giving me certainly a, a better understanding of Stars Without Number as a as a system overall. Because I'm I'm looking to find like okay, I'm not sure how this rule works, but I'm gonna look and see other things that are similar, so I can kind of learn the the design. And then occasionally, once or twice, I've been like, I can't I can't figure it out. <laughs> Kevin, save me. What what did you mean? What is this? Um, well, you've probably put a whole lot more thought into it than I have by now. <laughs> 
Right. And that's, I think that's, that's been, that's been really fun to, to be able to do that, to say, oh, like I see, I see a thing that maybe uh, if this were just me playing this game with myself, I, I would be expected to make this ruling because there's a little, there's a little gap here. There's a space. And, and, uh, yeah, if I were playing just just with myself, then it would be certainly easier to to make those choices. But it feels like there's a lot more people's kind of investment uh, at stake, which is good. It's it's really driven people to engage with the campaign as sort of media object in some very very intense ways. There's a, a ton of fan art. People are wringing detail out of the the little bits and pieces of uh, of Acheron Row. That I I would never have expected. It's it's fascinating world building with with so many people. Um, so thank you for yeah. for that. Uh, the the faction turn really for me was the thing that got me started on this. And and I, I when I read it, I could not have imagined a world where, you know, I would do a live stream to, you know, two thousand people watching me move things around on a spreadsheet. So you I'm intensely interested in what you have decided there. Yeah, we're living we're living the strange dream. Um, so yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to touch on the, on the faction turn and, and particularly, uh, you know, thank you on, be, on behalf of all the people that are, they're using it to, to create this, this sort of fiction about our new, our new world. Um, and, and also for coming in and hanging out and talking about, uh, about the game. Um, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to keep you, so I'll, I'll let you, I'll let you go. But where, where can, where can people, where can people find your work? Where would you like to direct them if they're interested in purchasing your games or, or finding out kind of what you're, what you're up to? Well, everything I sell is available on Drive to RPG, PDF, everything, and POD for what I have. You can get a free version of Stars Without Number, but it's in the original and revised edition. Free version of Dog Town. A lot of other free materials to supplement the game. Mm -hmm. even look at I've got supplements out to cater to particular campaign styles like mercenary groups or merchant campaigns or espionage campaigns. And I've, pretty much everything new I've got is going to be sharing the If you've got questions about my games, you can find me at the Senior Nominee Plus group, or else you can find me on Reddit. It starts about number. So there was there was a little bit of we got a little bit of mic mic distortion on that, but I think I think I, I heard you and can can re reiterate that. So uh, there's a there's a stars without number uh, Reddit group. Uh, there is a category on Drive Through RPG where you can find uh, PDFs, uh, print on demand of uh, of all of Kevin's work, uh, and and the the secret the secret layer of of game design on the internet still seems to be uh, Google Plus. There is there is a, a strong and dedicated group of people who use that as their their main uh, their main platform for discussing game design and, and i know for me when we were developing uh, dungeon world uh, we spent a ton of time uh, in that in that space so uh, those are all uh, all good places to go and uh, and check out that stuff so Cool. Well, thank you, thank you for uh, thank you for joining us, Kevin. Uh, this this has been really great. You know, normally the uh, the audience would be able to to see us, right? Normally we have a video component to this, and this is our this is sort of my first audio only thing. But it's been interesting watching chat. They can hear me smiling at at some of the things that you've you've been saying. We talk about tabletop RPGs a lot here, and uh, it's really it's really cool to bring on a designer who both does what I imagine to be like fairly different work from, from what you see in, in a lot of those, the games that I tend to portray, um, but still have a lot of very like similar ideas about, about design. And so thanks for coming in uh, and sharing your, your expertise with us. It's a great pleasure to be here. Yeah. Great. Well, uh, thanks for coming everybody. Uh, this, this has been, uh, this has been a, d a delightful time. Uh, we are going to, uh, we're going to go, I will, uh, I'll put this, uh, this episode up on, uh, on YouTube and I'll, I'll likely, uh, make an audio only version of it, uh, an MP3 version. And I'll, I'll post that on, uh, on Twitter and on my website for you to download. If you want to, if you want to listen to it, um, Thank you for coming, everybody. Uh, we will uh, we will see you again next time. Thanks again to Kevin Crawford for uh, for coming and, uh, and hanging out with us. We will uh, we will see you all next time. Bye, everybody.